Or she, that okay. she would be well and home and sound. Also, just continue to lift up Bob Rogers, if you would. So, Mr. Danny, <laughs> yeah, would you would you like to introduce your kinfolk? Oh, yeah, we got some kinfolk here. From they're now with us. And Tay is the lady's name. My uh, nephew and my niece, Tay and Mark. Mark and Tay, welcome, guys. We're so glad. We're so glad you're here. Well, I'm so glad you're here. So be welcome. Yeah. Okay, yes, absolutely. So, um, all right, the parting youngsters, the Lord bless you. Yes, indeed. You know, as we um, we begin today, uh, we, uh, as a message title, is going to be God's Heart Expressed as a Mother. And you know that there are several scriptural references that relate to God in a maternal sense. And so, you know, the Bible says that God is spirit, so we shouldn't really think of him, even though I said him, in a gender base, gender base. Uh, the reason that he's called Father is he's the origin of all things. And so, fathers have seed, and that's how that works. He starts things. And so, so but it's not gender based. And so, God expresses himself through mothers equally as he does through fathers, or women as he does through men. Are we all okay with that? Good, good, good. So normally what we do is we have a time of celebration. And, you know, there have been certain, I've preached these sermons too, where we quote a lot of people who give us an idea about the essence of a mother and what a mother has meant in their life and all those kind of things. And those are wonderful things to do too because we always are enriched by that. But um, I thought to myself today, you know, what, I asked the Lord what, how to go about this and what word to use, what message to use. And so um, I think he wants um, uh, he wants us to go as follows. Yes, indeed, um, it is God. We celebrate mothers and we celebrate motherhood. But even beyond that, we celebrate the God who has the heart to grant mothers and motherhood. Because it all comes out of our God. So really, we want to consider um, that side of it today. You know, in the Ten Commandments, both in Deuteronomy and in um, Exodus chapter 20, uh, there are seven thou shalt not statements. Um, uh, there is one thou shalt have no statement, no other God. Now these two statements, two other commandments, and one of them says, remember, you know what it says after that? Holy yeah, keep, yeah, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, yeah. And then there's another one, which is, starts off with honor. You know, it's pretty evident where we're going with that. <laughs> to honor our uh, fathers and mothers. And uh, so there's several things you can say about that. Uh, clearly, you know, it's including both fathers and mothers, but our focus today is clearly about uh, our moms. And so, but as it goes, it says, and this is from the Deuteronomy uh, version of it, 5 and 16, <clears throat> honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, comma, that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God gives you. So there's an idea with this that um, in doing what he's commanded you to do, that uh, there is a sort of a blessing and a, a um, an assurance from God about you and how things are going to go for you in terms of your just um, your own well-being, and then it also says, as well as your days being prolonged, that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. <clears throat> now, um, I think today we need to try to take hold of this what God has in mind when He's commanding us to do this. And so we need to look a little bit at the whole idea of honor. Now, I'm not going to belabor this endlessly. There's some very significant things to say here. Um, but I'll just touch a little bit about honor, the whole idea of honor. The, the Hebrew words habad and um, kabad, I should say. And it's very similar to the kabad, which is the word for glory. And really we can understand honor if we first start about glory a little bit. And so if we think about glory, we can think about 
something that's outer, usually often outer, observable, a reality of brilliance or a reality of radiance or beauty or splendor or great measure or wonderment. There's a matter of glory, you know, that you, you pick even in a human example, if a queen or king is going to go up for coronation, they come about that in all their splendor and all their glory. And there's an outward sense of the, the significance of it, the weight of it, the heaviness of it, how significant this is. Now, we don't have kings in America, so it's hard for us to get this. But if you go back far enough in, uh, in history, kings kind of ruled everything, had power over everything before parliaments came along, and that kind of thing. Kings were very, very uh, significant and mighty and weighty. And there is a king coming who will be the same. And there's one coming back who will be very mighty and very weighty, very, very much so. And he has uh, all um, honor and glory to be attributed to him. So it has to do with this question of significance, the weight of significance, the weight of a person, the, the, how um, the honor side of this is now that we esteem someone like this. We esteem them to have this. We esteem them, to, we reckon them to have great significance, great worth, great value. We esteem them that way. Now whether outwardly it seems that way or not, we are told to do this, to make them heavy in our sight. That's what this means. We are commanded to make our fathers and mothers heavy in our sight. Heavy in the impact they have in our life. Heavy in the way we would regard what they say. Heavy in, in esteeming the fact that they have uh, authority over us. And we would hope that they work that for good. But we are commanded to do this. Now, I don't know what the, um, you know, the hyper-grace people do uh, on a day like this and where they don't think the Old Testament applies to anything, you know, or the, old, the, the Ten Commandments aren't, um, you know, all that significant. And I don't know what you do about this because it's clearly God's heart, and that doesn't change. This is God's heart. God's heart is speaking this way, and there's something about this that we have to take hold of that this question, we're commanded to do this. And then there's another side to that, that, that's significant also. He says that this is a condition, or we can look at it as a promise, but there's a condition that's related to it. In so doing, that you're going to prolong your days. So you can say there's motivation if you want, but I just say condition, you know. And that it may be well with you in the land that God is going to put you on. Now, I don't want to get too far off base here or get sort of into a crazy um, conspiracy kind of crazy mindset thing. However, I'm going to say this. That the institution of fatherhood and motherhood is so significant to God. So, so, so significant to God. That after he's done dealing with how to think about him, how to think about the Sabbath, and the very next thing is about fathers and mothers. The very next thing is it begins to be related to us. It's so significant to God. So the institution of marriage is from God, of God, by God, through God, for a man and a woman. And in that, then, therefore, the whole establishment of what a family means and the authority that is passed down through fathers and mothers, through children, that children can prosper and do well, that is all ordained by God. It is all planned out by God. It is all set in place by God. And God wants to protect that. God wants to ensure that that works. And you can tell very clearly this is God's heart by what he says, that it will go well with you in the land. Now, when we set about saying in the name of diversity, we're going to redefine marriage as a country and have uh, all kind of ways that you could say that marriage is set up, whether it's a man and a man, a woman and a woman, two women and a man, three women, because once you say it's no longer a man and a woman, then what you say is it's no longer within the bounds of what God has said. Could we say amen to that? And if it's no longer within the bounds of what God has said, then there's no limit to what you can make a marriage. And really, those 
forces on the earth that want to destabilize and deconstruct that which God has put in order, they will want every imaginable combination of things happening with men and women that somehow get some kind of, um, I don't know the right word here, some kind of approval or credential from the government. And the idea will be here that you will no longer, as time will unfold, you know, can no longer look to a biblical model in society because if you're going to have three men living together, be married, have legal rights, or two women and, and four men or whatever you're going to have, uh, and I know those are, it seems like exotic examples, but really just run the timeline. It'll get that way. Yeah. So, um, so then the only way to deal with that is to have the government enter into individual contracts with people. The government will sit down and enter into individual contracts with people and say, these are your responsibilities, and if it doesn't work out, then you're going to have to do this, just you have to do all these other things. And so in so doing that, they completely detach what God has put in order and detach the authority that God has given to a man and a woman as a family to, to be part of a family, to create a family together, and to be able to raise a child. They will detach that and say that's no longer a godly thing. Now it is a social thing, human thing, and it's under the government. And I have to tell you, as far-fetched as that would have been 20 years ago, we're not that far away from that kind of crazy thinking right now. And we're not. Because once there's a legal um, position put in place that... that Marriage is not defined as God has defined it, but it's whatever we think it should be. Then we've lost all sense of this. Now, why do I bring all that up? Because God says in this fifth commandment that if you do these things, honor your father and your mother. In other words, the established set that I am putting in place, the established order that I am putting in place, the established way that I am putting in place, the established means that I am putting in place, that which has been created by me, affirmed by me, blessed by me, and that which will bring you blessings and go well with you on the land in which I'm giving you, then if we move from that, then I can tell you the opposite of that will be true too. It will no longer go well with us. Yeah. Hear me, church, it will no longer go well with us. Because that's the promise to do with this commandment, is it not? Can you all hear it? So it's not being against anybody, it's being for God. Can we say amen? amen? And that's where we must be, in love for God. Standing not against folks. You know, we hear government officials say, who are you to tell anyone who they should love? And my response to that is, who are you to tell us not to be godly? Who are you to tell us not to have a godly standard or a godly heritage? Who are you? So, I mean, I don't mean that to be provocative, but really, who are you? We have a country founded on principle, Christian principles, and, and I won't say everybody's been a Christian, I won't say everybody has um, followed that, but, um, uh, but you have a, a, a country for the most part that desire greatly to follow Christian precepts. So here we have God saying there's something very significant in honoring, and it's going to go well for you. Now, um, this is a, uh, such a significant thing. Let me give you God's other point of view about this. Should you choose to take this lightly or not to honor? He says this on Proverbs 20 and 20. He who curses his father or his mother, his lamp will go out in time of darkness. That is to say, the covering of grace and blessings the cover of God's goodness and all that God can and will provide for you. If you think lightly of your mother and father, if you think, I don't want to curse, but you say ugly things over them and despise them and, and, and utterly disrespect them and so forth, and God say, I'm not going to help you when things get tough. <laughs> that scares me. That absolutely, because God will hold this up. God will hold this up. It says in Proverbs 30 and 17, the eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the belly will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. God is absolutely angry. Angry at those who will not honor their mother and father. Amen. Now you're going to say to me, yeah, but preacher, maybe half the people in here, their mother or their father um, wasn't any paragon of virtue, they weren't all that loving. 
And I said that earlier. Some of them would say, my mother or father was sort of opposed to me. My mother or father neglected me. My mother or father was brutal. My mother or father was harsh. Or they were vindictive. Or they were all that. And you read stories like this where, where mothers leave kids off and just wander off. And kids are orphans and their mother just leaves. How does a heart survive that? And all kind of, and it's not against women or, you know, sin is sin, whether it's male or female. So it's not against anyone. But it is, it is that, that sinful and broken people, you know, there, there are outcomes in their life, and the outcomes affect families. And then the person on the other side who's the child of that, then they're in this great dilemma. And what is the dilemma? Well, I, I, I'm not going to honor my mother. I'm not going to honor my father. That was the sorriest, you know, person that, 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 that made my life miserable. They put me in the corner all the time. They didn't feed me half the time. I'm not saying there's anyone here that's, that's gone through that. But, you know, that's not so uncommon. Those kinds of very difficult circumstances are everywhere. And then you would say to yourself, if you were close to that, you would say to yourself, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I hate my mother. I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm sort of dramatizing this. Do you follow? And, and, and so therefore you make it conditional. If my mother and father were good, I'll honor them. Now, God will not allow you to make this conditional. This is not a wisdom statement. This is not a suggestion. This is a commandment. I would say to me, my heart and your heart, who are you to establish perfection as the judge of anybody else, whether it's your mother or father. Who are you to say to your mother, unless you're near perfect, I'm not going to honor you? Because you yourself are not near perfect. So we have no business trying to apply that standard towards our mothers or fathers. As ugly as they may have been, as difficult as they may have been, we can't apply that. Now, should we apply wisdom? Absolutely. Should we apply sound God, judgment? Yeah, absolutely. But God has got something in mind here about honoring. There's something in mind that God has about esteeming and honoring and giving weight. So it's not conditional on whether or not they were good. Although you would rejoice if your mother and father was good. Praise God. If your mother and father was good, we rejoice. But he's holding us to this. And he's holding us to this for his glory and for our well-being. Because if you refuse to honor your mother or father, then you will allow soulish rot to take place. And you will become bitter. Yes. And there's such a root to bitterness, you'll have a hard time perhaps all the way through your life getting rid of that. Yes. So God is saying, for your sakes, even if they were less than perfect, even if your parents were letting you get her, you better get on my heart on this. Honor them anyway. Yeah. Do the best you can to respect them anyway. You might not do all the things that they tell you to do when you're a grown-up person. They still want to control your life. You may have to cut some apron strings and do all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean you slink them off and you throw them off and say, I'm not going to listen to you. You've ruined my life. That's the last time I'm ever going to talk to you. No. If you belong to God, you are a means of reconciliation towards that relationship with your mother. Amen. You think it shouldn't work that way. They're the ones who perpetrated. And I, God's saying to you, it doesn't matter. If you belong to me, you are the means of grace for them. Can we say amen to that, church? And that's for your sake. Because in your hurt, in your brokenness, in your neediness, God wants to show His great love to you. He wants to show how wonderful He wants to treat your heart and bless your heart. And not to take this into your own um, hands, as it were. Not, not to... So, He's saying that your life would be long on the earth. I just believe that. I'm naive enough to believe that. That if I honor my father and my mother, my mother texted me a few months ago, and she said, my mother, my father, um, this is the, the anniversary of his death, 63 years ago, and I still miss him every day. My mother still honors her father, who died 63 years ago. My mother's 92. I promise you these things are connected. Amen. And she's not in perfect health, but she's quicker in mind than I am. Not that that's any big measure, but you follow what I'm saying. <laughs> <She> okay. 
If I get anything just a little bit off, I say, if I told her one thing three weeks ago and it's a little different, when I bring it up again, she'll say, well, you, last time you told me this, it was a Tuesday you did that. <laughs> Still a mom. Yeah, that's right. Still a mom. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have it any other way. It's just wonderful. Praise God for that. You know, you have to watch yourself uh, talking to your mom. She's 68 years old. It's just wonderful. <laughs> Honoring your father and your mother, honoring is deciding, deciding that they're going to be weighty. It's a decision that they're going to be weighty, in my estimation. Katie, down here, Jenny's mama was 95 or 96, I forget what. 95. Precious woman of God. Came in here, couldn't really hear too well, but she was just filled with the Spirit, and uh, she was just radiant, and a blessing in your life. It's precious, precious. Whalens, precious people. Precious, precious, precious. And I just want to tell you, they're connected. They're connected to believe God, even in this, to honor your mother and your father. I want to read to you from Psalm 113. And really, I know this is Mother's Day, and some of you may have planned to take your husband and wife or Mother here, some of you may have planned to take your mother out, so I don't want to be the cause of messing that up so it won't be too long, and you can go all, and, and if you haven't planned to take your mother out and you can take your mother out, plan now. <laughs> take your mother out. <laughs> right now, wait yourself a chance before this ends up. Mom, what do you say we go so-and-so? Or she might say, do you have any money? And you say, well, not really, but let's go anyway. <laughs> and that's all right, you know, because you want to celebrate with her, so... Psalm 113 and 1 and following. I just want you to feel God's heart. I want you to feel God's heart. The scripture is self-revealing. I want you to feel God's heart. Praise the Lord. Praise those servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. So clearly, this is a, a psalm that esteems and reveres the Lord. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? This is about honor and glory. Can you feel this? You feel, you know, speaking about God who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God is a humble God. And I tell you right here that honor is connected to humility. All through the Bible, God will honor those who are humble. All through the Bible. He will honor you if you're humble. That means you have to get over yourself. That's really what it means. You have to get over your big opinion. You have to get over your agenda. You know, because we don't like anybody to tell us what to do. We really don't. Even commandments. They're conditional for us. Well, you know. But God humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth. Now, we're teaching a prosperity class. And, you know, prosperity has all kind of ways to be seen and elements and aspects. Um, that prosperity can sometimes be understood by what it's not. Prosperity means that you're no longer hurting, lacking, in turmoil, in trial, in distress, in wrong thinking, in darkness, in, in, uh, in those sorts of things. It means that God has worked in your life in such a way that those things are changing. And you're beginning to prosper. You're beginning to do well. You're beginning to advance. You're no longer in the same place. It is not God's heart to have you in the same place. You do not want your children to be in the same place. You want your children to do well. You know, I, uh, I'm a football fan, and I watched a little bit of the NFL draft this past uh, Thursday or something, whatever day it was. And I watched the first round for a little bit. And it was remarkable to me how these great hulking big men would come out there, and three or, well, three of them had their mothers come out with them. Now, some of them in the green room had their dads too, but they, each of them brought their mothers out with them. And when 
they were there in front of God and everybody, they were saying, you know, I mean, they were being interviewed, nothing. It would not have happened without my mother. Without my mother helping, and without my mother encouraging, without my mother believing in me, without my mother uh, causing this to happen, it would not have happened. These huge big men whose lives are radically and irrevocably changed. They move from just being an ordinary college level ball player than someone who will make millions of dollars and their families will be blessed and great things are ahead of them. And they so quickly, so quickly, many of them gave credit to their mothers. They honored their mothers. That's humility. You could come out there and say, no, it's me. I'm big. I'm six, you know, whatever, 320 pounds and I'll knock anybody's block off. You can go that direction. But God can't bless them. Here's what it says in verse 7. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Now, we are talking about prosperity. But I tell you what, if you like to sort of circle up important verses in the Bible that you can dwell on, camp out on, and seek to have that in your heart, well, I'll read it again. He raises the poor from the dust. Now, clearly we're not talking about poor in spirit here. It's very physical. You can feel the physicality. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. Really? To make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. God's heart is to move you from here and get you over here. Can you say amen? amen? It really is. You have to understand his heart and get in agreement with his heart and get some humility. If you're holding on to things being the same way as they always are, then your mind is closed and you have no humility. But if you can hear God, I want to move you from here and get you over here. Amen. Every one of us. There's no one that he doesn't want to do that for. No one. Amen. No one. Amen. But you have to believe it. You have to have faith. You have to be. There's a relationship to righteousness here too, which that's a whole other message. And then it says this. The last verse says this. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Now, this is God's very heart. He made a woman and the very nature of a woman is such that there's joy in her heart when she has a house and she's well regarded, she's got a place to be, she's not a turmoil, and then she has some children. There's joy in her heart. Can you say amen? amen? See, if there were not joy in her heart, we'd all be a mess here. But God has made a woman so that when the right conditions are in place, there will be joy in her heart when women come into her house. Can we say amen? amen? Thank God for every mother who had those circumstances and you lived under that. Because when there's joy in a mother's heart, guess where that joy is going to end up? Your heart. Can you feel God in that? This is what he wants to establish. He wants to establish. And you know, the world tells you, no, 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 mom, you need to get out there and just beat the world and get everything and you make everything, you run after things and do all those things. Well, sometimes there, you know, there's the um, expediency of survival and you have to do some things. But God's heart isn't that way. God's heart that when a man and a woman honor God, I don't want to be so old-fashioned that, oh, my and the law, he doesn't understand modern times. Well, it doesn't matter about modern times. What is God's heart? In the ideal, when a man and a woman are completely committed to one another under God, what he says is, I will provide. And ideally, he would have the woman for that season being able to take care of the kids at the house. I'm just going to say that. It doesn't matter whether it's in tune with today's and, the, and it's not diminishing ladies, it's not diminishing your worth, it's not diminishing all the other values and capacities and capabilities and all the other things God has to do for a child. How you can touch a child, mold a child, change a child, bring a child up. Put love in his heart. Children need joy in their heart. Can we say amen? amen. They need joy in their heart. It comes from mothers. It comes from mothers. This is um, Psalm 113, first and second verse. O 
O Lord, my heart is not proud, humility, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or things too difficult for me in this day. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul, meaning in Christ, meaning in God, like a weaned child rest against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. There is something so profound about this, to understand a child's heart, because spiritually we all want to be in the same place. To understand a child's heart, that a mother has the ability to so comfort and love, so assure that child that they're precious, assure that child that they're beautiful on this side, assure that child that they're good, assure that child that they're so precious, to, so esteemed, so honor the child. The child is completely satisfied at rest and has joy. This is God's heart. This is why we honor others. This is why we do it, that that would not be lost on the earth. God's... It's all good. Whatever the squeaking is, who's, who's doing the squeaking? Oh, you're squeaking your name? Oh, okay. You want me to talk up? You want to speak them up? Talk up. What is that? What kind of language is that? You want me to speak up? Okay. All right, well, you sort of get, you get the uh, essence of this. Um, and so there's some things that it says in Proverbs to observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. A mother teaches the young child how to, uh, how to do right, what's most important. A wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. Almost always it's the men who are messing up, and he's, I don't know why God picks it up that way, but. It's usually the man messing up. <laughs> Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. That's very much so uh, what can happen in this generation. If we don't respect our mothers, this is what happens. They get older. They're a nuisance. They're using up my time. I, I got things to do. And they're no longer useful. Right? So it's pragmatism. God says, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Your day is coming. Watch yourself. <clears throat> the rod and reproof give wisdom. I look that word rod up so many different ways. I've heard people explain this away. That, that, that you can't explain it away. And it means a staff, a club. It means a shaft. It means rough stuff. That's what it means. I, I know this by experience what it means. <laughs> And so, um, you know, mostly I'm white. But, you know, I remember when, uh, <laughs> when my father got a hold of me, there'd be parts of me that were no longer white. <laughs> they'd be either red or black and blue, and then they'd turn green and yellow. You know how that... <laughs> None of you ever had any of that. I know you all have been too blessed. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you this, if your mother wasn't as good as you would like, or even she wasn't in place, or even, you know, you were raised by an auntie or something of that nature, and some of these words are hard because we speak about the ideal, and there's a vacancy in your heart, there's a longing in your heart. And it says in Psalm 27, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. I want you to hear that, you who are hurting today. The Lord will take you up. And there are times when life is sorrowful. There are times when life is sorrowful. And it's wonderful to know that the Lord will take me up. Praise God. And I want to leave with this. This is the, uh, the last one I'll use. It's James. I'm going to skip one. I'll finish up with James 2.18. And, um, <clears throat> but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. And show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And you think, whoa, preacher, you're off the mark here. It's about mothers. And I just want to say this to you. What that verse is saying is, is that you can talk about faith. You can talk about the way faith works. You can talk about what's involved in faith. You can talk about your understanding of faith. You can talk about all of that. You can tell me all about the way that you understand it. You can talk about it forever and ever and ever. And that's okay. 
What he's saying here is that I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you my faith by the works that it produces. Real faith produces real works. Can we say amen? amen. Not just words. Real faith produces real works. Amen. I just want to say why this verse is significant. Real love produces real works too. And I think that God does the very same thing in a mother's heart. A mother is just going to love because that's what's in her heart. And that love is going to be manifested. I will show you my love by my works. Now, a mother wouldn't say that. But the mothers I know and the mother I have, that's the way she was and that's the way she is to this day. It simply is in her heart to love. It is the greatest gift anyone has on the earth to have a mother like that, to love. It is the way God has made her to love, to have joy with children, to have joy in her family, and not to be taught, not to be told that you're missing life. It's the other way around. The life that we really need is in Christ Jesus. And so from our mothers, love is manifest because God has put that in our mothers. So I want to say a prayer for all of you mothers. And um, in this sort of tender place, you might have something in your heart where you want to say something to your mother by prayer to God about your mother. Even if you have some regret, hurt, unforgiveness, things of that nature. I just encourage you, you can either come up here or just be in your seat. But some of you today, the Holy Spirit might say to you that God wants you free from that. He wants you free to enjoy your own life, your children's life, and maybe perhaps to be reconciled with your mom. Remember, you are the agent of grace. Whether she desires it or not, you would hold that in your heart. So I want to pray. Lord, today we've heard uh, a whole lot about moms. And I believe, God, that we've heard your heart about motherhood. And um, you, speak, you spoke about Jerusalem, that you would be like a hen, a mother hen that would gather them up but they wouldn't come. Lord, we know that a mother's heart really is the maternal side of you. This is loving, seeing heart. And I, I don't mean this to be wrong, God, oftentimes our fathers see what we haven't done. And uh, mothers are more quickly to see what we have done. And to bless us in that. I want to speak over every heart here, God, that you give grace and mercy and kindness and fill every heart, God, with new love for their mother, new esteem for their mother, new gladness of heart. Even, Lord, if it was hard, or they would surrender the harshness, they'd surrender the hurt, they'd surrender the, 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 the weariness and the tears to you, God. Now, oh, God, I would ask you just to come in if they surrendered. Come in and refresh Give them your love, God. Your word said that you will take us up. For those today that you need to take up, oh God, take them up. Take them up. And for all of us, Lord, let us surrender any misgiving we have with our parents, and particularly with our mom. So Lord, now I just want to bless our moms and bless everyone here that we would rejoice today in your goodness. How beautiful and faithful you are. How great you are, dear God. So we love you, our God. We love you, our God. And Lord, if there's one here today who doesn't know Jesus as Lord, anyone, God, that they would have felt your love today in this message and say, I surrender. I surrender from striving. I surrender from making it in my strength. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I know that you are Lord. I confess you with my mouth. And I know that that, Lord, that you were raised the third day. Now, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God was raised the third day, the Bible says you'll be saved. Simply ask Him to come in, cleanse you, and forgive you of your sins, and abide in you. I just encourage you today in these tender moments, if you've never truly and completely done that, to do that today. Otherwise, God, as we dismiss, we bless you, our God. We love you, our God. We thank you, our God, for our mothers. Let this day be filled with complete joy for everyone who is a mom and for everyone who has a mom. Oh, God, we bless you. We love you. We say it in Christ's name.
Amen, amen, and amen. Well, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We are dismissed.